Robert Fisk, thank you very much for joining us in Antwerp today, uh, for coming over for the Mo lecture. Um, <clears throat> as we prepare for the lecture tonight, I would like to um, dive into the Middle East and, and the conflicts that we're seeing there right now. And, and maybe let's go back a few years uh, to the beginning of the uprising in, in Syria, which then turned into a armed uprising very quickly. Can you briefly give your idea of why this shift from a civil unrest and an and uprising into an armed uh, uprising happened and, and why? Well, um, I can try. Um, there's a problem with this particular question in that you see most newspapers, including my own, had correspondence on both sides of the war. We had a correspondent who was with the rebels. We had me as a Middle East correspondent on the Syrian side of the front line, the government side of the front line. It didn't mean that our correspondent on the other side was on the side of the rebels or that I was on the side of the government. But we had, as in most wars, a correspondent on both sides. But of course, once the uh, opposition became violent and radicalized in Islam, the correspondents on the other side fled. Uh, they were wise to do so. And those who didn't, we've seen what happened to them on videotape. They died. So there was an immediate cut in the information we had from the other side. I did my best to learn from the Damascus side of the front line what was happening. Um, I think there are a number of things over the months, the years that have passed since 2011 that I've learned. For example, even in May of 2011, there were armed men on the streets of Dira in southern Syria. And there was a gun battle between Syrian troops and armed men on the Lebanese border, uh, way northeastern border of Lebanon. Uh, and this again is in April, May. So at the very beginning of the 2011 revolution in Syria, there were armed groups involved in fighting the Syrian army and Syrian government militias. As, as the government put in an armed response as well? Well, you see, the question is who shot first? Well, I think the government did. I don't think there's any doubt, or there is no doubt, and indeed I've had government ministers admit this to me, that at the beginning when the crisis developed and there were large-scale demonstrations in the streets against the regime, the regime reacted in the time-honored dictatorial brutal way, ruthless way, that it always had done in the past. Shoot down the demonstrators, cow them, send them home, pick up their relatives, torture them, and so on. Initially what happened is we saw a large group of opposition people on the streets of major cities like Homs, for example, who were in many cases composed not just of the poorer classes in Syria and the unemployed, but of middle class people, in, including Christians, and in some cases, very brave cases, Alawites too. Alawites, of course, being um, Alawite being the, the sect of uh, Shiite sect of the, the government of Bashar al-Assad, not the government itself, but of the leadership. And I think at this time you see some people decided that the government had become so brutal in putting down the oppression that they wanted weapons to defend their families or to take revenge for members of their families who'd been killed. And remember, this wasn't just the army involved in this, it was particularly the state security organizations, of which there are at least seven in Syria, of which the most ruthless is um, Air Force Security. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with the Air Force, but it's called Air Force Security for historical reasons we don't have time to go in for, into. Um, and I think that there was an element then of, well, the government wants to play this by guns, so we can do that too. Mm -hmm. Syrians have always been um, a very proud people and have always been, um, have always felt uh, few reservations about turning to weapons to defend their honor. Mm. Um, that applies to an awful lot of people and it would have done in Europe until quite recently. Um, but I think there's something else you have to realize is that unlike Egypt or Tunisia, where there was a large number of unemployed, poor and poorly educated people, in Syria, what happened is that in the early years of Bashar al-Assad's rule, which started in 2000 with the death of his father Hafez, a number of land reforms, quote unquote, were 
enacted, which effectively disinherited many farmers and their workers in the great cornfields and agricultural belts of Syria. And the unemployed in their hundreds of thousands, this is in the late uh, sort of 2008, 2009, the late 2010s, if you like, they moved en masse into the poor suburbs surrounding the major cities of Aleppo and Damascus. That's why the fighting has more or less in those two cities, with the exception of a little bit of Aleppo, has been in the suburbs. Because it was this disinherited, unemployed, poor, poorly educated people, agricultural workers, people whose life was molded by the battle against the desert rather than the battle against the regime, yeah. suddenly found that the land they had cultivated for generations was taken from them effectively, that they were, they had no future. So they went to the place where money was, which was cities, and they built bidonville, more and more slums around the, uh, particularly in eastern Aleppo, and particularly around Damascus. And that's why we find that even today, it's the slum suburbs on the ring around Damascus, which are the center of the civil war in the capital. The center of Damascus is in many ways untouched, not quite so Aleppo, and certainly not the case in Homs, which is too small a city for that ring to have actually formed itself. So what lies behind the revolution in Syria was actually a form of agrarian revolution, not agrarian revolution of the poor taking lands from the rich, but the poor having the lands taken from them for reasons of bureaucracy and party. Yeah. And thus you had a very large proportion of people easily led by local dictators, if you like, whether they be militias, Islamist groups, what have you, who would find themselves born up in this revolution against the regime. And of course, being people from the country, they tended to have a very uncritical view of people who expressed their views in religious terms. They wouldn't say, well, hold on a second, is that exactly what the Quran says? You know, exactly, is that exactly what our father would have believed? And so on and so forth. And of course, they were angry. If you add to this the government militias who were carrying out massacres in some villages, particularly in one case, a whole village outside Latakia, you had the makings of a civil war. So to say, well, why did these nice, peaceful opponents turn into this ISIS monster or Nusra monster? At the very beginning, we also had some defections, of course, from the Syrian government army. Soldiers who said, look, these are my people. I'm not going to shoot at them. But they were quickly suborned, joined other groups, forced into other groups, paid to do nothing, in some cases encouraged successfully to come back to the government side. Outside Syria, because of the lack of information, because no journalists were any longer prepared to report the rebel side, many newspapers and television, radios, I suppose blogs and websites, I don't read them, but uh, they, they wanted a simple picture because they didn't have a complex picture. It was impossible to get it. And the simple picture was that all these peace-loving opponents of the regime demonstrated bravely, suffered and sometimes died, and suddenly, overnight, monsters appeared and took over the revolution and stole the revolution, and it wasn't like that. Um, ISIS, uh, ISIS cannot exist, even though most of its territory is desert. No trees, as you've seen in the photographs. Um, ISIS could not exist if it did not have some foundational popularity. We come to that later, but I would like to, to take a, a step in between because from the early days till today, not only we saw the emergence of, uh, of ISIS and al-Nusra and other uh, radical groups, but also the internationalization of the conflict. It is, in a sense, an in international conflict today, not just between Syrians and the regime, but all kinds of uh, neighboring states and faraway powers are involved. Guy, can you name for me any civil war that was not internationalized within 12 months? Any civil war. Do you think the Spanish Civil War wasn't internationalized? The Italians were involved, the fascists, the Nazis were involved, Stalin's communists were involved, the British were involved, the League of Nations were involved in putting, uh, putting sanctions on weapons into Spain? Do you think that wasn't internationalized? Immediately. 
Do you think the Lebanese civil war wasn't? You had the Israelis in southern Lebanon. You had the Americans and the Israelis supporting the Christians. You had the French supporting the Christians. You had the Egyptians and, and, and various other groups, and particularly Palestinians supporting the leftists. Every civil war will become internationalized because when a civil war happens, central authority disappears and the country belongs to everybody, not just the people who live there. But, but how do you analyze this international involvement in Syria right now? Who are the players that matter most? I don't like the word players because that's the one thing they're not. Um, the people who are not players is everybody. There isn't a single country which is not involved, even in a negative, doing nothing way, towards Syria, whether it be in a superpower, Russia, America, NATO, whether it be regional powers, Iraq, which is bleeding militias into Syria, Turkey, which is helping ISIS and pretending it's not helping ISIS, but hating and bombing the Kurds, whether it be Lebanon, which is itself divided between Sunni Muslims who support the rebels or did at one point, and Christians who don't want too much criticism of Assad because Assad supposedly and to some extent does protect the Christians and other minorities in Syria. Israel, which bombs the Syrian government forces and the Iranian forces, but will not and does not bomb ISIS. Um, every international power in the region and every, re every major every superpower is involved in Syria, of course, of course it is. Which, which is a picture of, of almost international chaotic involvement. Well, yeah, but you're starting from the wrong end. As I said to you at the beginning, name me a civil war that is not immediately internationalized. When a civil war happens, it means that there is no central authority to which everyone, the unity of the country is finished. Mm -hmm. That's why Itihad Arabiya, Arab unity is so important in the Middle East, you see. Once it goes, you belong to everyone. But that applies to every civil war. Look, what happened when the Germans invaded Yugoslavia in 1941? They supported the Ustashi Croat Catholic Christians against the Serbs, and the civil war between Serbs and Christians, and in some cases involving the Muslims, in some cases on the Nazi side, became so terrible that the German army couldn't stop the civil war. And they were definitely involved, and so were the British, because we were supporting Tito, you may remember, just as the Germans were supporting the Poglavnik uh, in in, uh, in Zagreb, in Croatia. Um, But some people try to, to, to make sense of this uh, very uh, maybe splintered involvement of, uh, of international uh, powers in the, in the civil war. And, and they use the prism of uh, a Sunni alliance against uh, the Shia sort of alliance. I think these things exist in the offices of American professors at universities in the United States. Um, When I go to Syria, this simply is not what I'm seeing. Look, I go to the Syrian army's front lines inside Syria. And I'm, you know, I fly there on my own. I don't have a minder. And the army allow me to go to the front lines. And one of the things I always do is I want to say, what's your religion? And I had a field commander on the edge of Damascus. So why don't you go and ask all my soldiers? I've got 72 checkpoints. So I drove around 30 of the checkpoints and I was horrified at myself for doing so. I asked each soldier what his religion were and by far the largest majority of course was Sunni. Most of the generals in the Syrian government army are Sunni. Now in certain brigades there are Alawites. Of course it is an Alawite regime, we know that. The president is an Alawite which is a sect of Shiism and Shiites are a minority in Syria. But the, most, the, the majority of the army are Sunni Muslim. So what we call a civil war is in fact a political war between opponents of the regime and supporters of the regime, the majority of whom on both sides are Sunni. Yeah. That is that not a civil war, is it, you see? But, but that doesn't a war necessarily about a stop, about religion. stop uh, countries like, uh, or regimes like Saudi Arabia and Qatar to think in terms of, uh, of a Sunni alliance against... They have Sh never thought in terms of a Sunni alliance. They thought of Sunnis versus Shiites in the whole Middle East. No Saudi has ever supported or wished for a powerful nation in Iran unless it is supported and controlled by the United States. They were quite happy, although they didn't like it, to have the Shah of Iran, our policeman in the Gulf, remember? He was a figure whom the West loved and all the West's allies in the Middle East, the Gulf Arabs, Egypt had to love. Once there was a revolution and the Shiite religious clerics effectively took over Iran, 
Iran became part of the great um, semicircle, the crescent of crisis. That was the first. Reagan, I think, used that phrase. We didn't know there was a crescent of crisis until the Americans told us. And now you have a situation where the Sunnis of the Gulf and the Sunnis of Egypt and up to a point the Sunni Palestinians of both Palestine, quote unquote, and Jordan are being set up against the Shiites, the Hezbollah, the rulers in Damascus, the Shiite government, which effectively it is in Iraq, and Iran. So you have, you know, this crescent, you see the, the crescent of Shiism. There's also a crescent of Sunnism, but it isn't put like that because we're supposed to be on the Sunni side, or at least we were until America decided to have some kind of agreement over the nuclear facilities with Iran, which suggested the Americans may be tipping towards the Shiites and away from the Sunnis. And that is why the Saudis are so worried. And that is one reason, I suspect, why ISIS is flourishing with funds from the Sunni Gulf. Are you effectively saying that ISIS is financed out of Saudi Arabia? Out and of, yes. Now, look, if you say the Saudi kingdom, the government, is funding ISIS, you will get a letter, as I've got, from an extremely wealthy firm of London solicitors telling you that this is a highly libelous thing to say. Let's forget, you know, that 15 of the 19 hijackers of 9-11 were Saudis, that Osama bin Laden was a Saudi, that the Saudis supported the Taliban. There's no doubt that a huge amount of funding for ISIS comes from within Saudi Arabia. Now, whether you believe or not that the government can or cannot control this funding is up to your sense of humor, I suppose. But the fact is that the foundational philosophy of Saudi Arabia, which is Saudi Wahhabism, Abdul Wahhab's preachings on the purity of Islam, the need to destroy history effectively as being unclean, corrupt, uh, impure, the idea that there is only one Sunni carefully ordered Islam and one interpretation. That is exactly the inspirational foundation which the Saudis passed on to the Taliban, which they passed on to ISIS, which they passed on to some extent to Nusra, which is definitely being supported by the Qatari Emir. And of course, it is what um, these regimes see in any Sunni movement outside. Uh, movements which, if you see, for example, in Saudi Arabia, where most of the historical heritage of Islam has been destroyed, and most of the great monuments of Afghanistan was destroyed by followers of the Wahhabi faith, which of course started in Arabia, or what is now Saudi Arabia. Um, same in Pakistan, the destruction of shrines, particularly Shiite shrines, and now the destruction of uh, religious shrines in Syria and the Roman city of Palmyra and so on and so forth. Um, the Wahhabi religious sect in Saudi Arabia is the same as ISIS. Syria used to be known as, of course, a Muslim country, but with a with a outspokenly secular regime. A uh, very dictatorial and brutal and, regime. Yeah. Yeah. But in a in a sense it was it was a, a secular place. Uh, there was the uprising and then all of a sudden uh, that uprising seems to take a very Islamist uh, turn. And you said... Why that is that surprising? It did in Hama. Hama, the uprising in 82, in which up to 20,000 uh, Muslim fighters and civilians were killed by the regime, was an avowedly Sunni religious uprising. Muslim Brotherhood. Well, Muslim Brotherhood then, but in fact, I got into Hama for a few hours during that siege when the government forces were shelling the roof off one of the oldest mosques in Hama, actually s next to a tank that was firing shells at the mosque. Um, this was seen as being an Islamist uprising. And if you read the tracts put out by the various local Sunni groups, they didn't call themselves the Akwan, the Brotherhood. They called themselves, you know, the courageous martyrs for the Islamic Hama. Um, these people's tracts about destroying and beheading the Ba'athist apostates was almost identical to the material you see now in ISIS magazine Dabiq against the Syrian regime. It, was not, it wasn't surprising that this became Islamist. The opposition to the dictatorship in Syria for the whole period of the Assad regime, and at some points before that, was always had a strongly Islamist, non-secular character. That what you're saying uh, earlier uh, when you said ISIS could not have prospered if there was not uh, a foundation within the population that 
would be receptive to their to their view, to their message, Look, to their our ideology. Problem is that we keep we in the West, not in the East where they know their history very well because it's their history. We in the West keep believing that these crises begin on a certain day at a certain time when we saw it on television. They're here, ISIS, monstrous. Who are they? We never ask why are they there. The invasion of Iraq in 2003 had something to do with it, didn't it? Uh, Saudi um, Wahhabi faith has a lot to do with it. Saudi Arabia has been involved in revolution for a very long time. The first revolution being that, of course, of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, but we don't deal with history. We don't want to deal with history. And you won't comprehend what's happening in Syria unless you go back actually to Sykes-Picot and then the French occupation, which was extremely brutal. Um, when, of course, the French, in order to keep the Sunnis under control, used a force speciale, special forces made up mostly of Alawites. You see, the Alawites were placed by the French as colonial controllers even before the Second World War. Now, unless you take this into account, and you see the fact that the Sunnis have always been therefore identified as Sunni religious opposition to a secular French and then a secular Ba'athist regime, the nationalists never really took off in Syria. They were always crushed or imprisoned, alas, except for the nationalist dictators. You will never comprehend why ISIS exists and why, for example, bombing ISIS has, is, is completely irrelevant to dealing with how you, you confront this threat which it is a threat. I mean, people who will suddenly pop up in the middle of Paris and carry out the atrocity that occurred on the 13th of October. This is not, you know, there is a reason behind this. Uh, and, and one of the things we never do is ask the question, why? After 9-11, everyone wanted to know who, you know, 19 hijackers, all of whom claimed they were Muslims, or how, box cutters, aeroplanes, tall buildings. But the moment you ask why, then you enter dangerous historical territory. America's support for Muslim dictators, America's support for Israel, and that was a, these were questions you were not allowed to ask. The moment I asked them, on the night of 9-11, I had the most reputable experts condemning me as pro-terrorist on the BBC television and radio. You see? Yeah. And, and, and that's the problem. And unless we see Syria as a product of its past as well as its present, we will come up with crazed ideas about bombing Syria again. I mean, the idea of bombing people to solve a problem has never worked in history. Even in Roman times, crucifying them didn't really work. Um, it, it's, it's an extraordinary fact that I think because of the internet and because of television and because most people's experience of war is cinema or TV movies, that we in the West who make these momentous decisions of violence and war are largely disconnected from real war. The people of the Middle East are not. You know, we have these complicated things. You know, Belgium is on um, danger zone four or danger zone three, and America is purple or red. But, you know, the Arab, the cities of the Arab world are under permanent red security alert. All their existence and all their lives of the people are always under the threat of imminent violence. Yeah. But we don't appreciate that. We think that when this, you know, in the past, we've been able to go on foreign adventures, uh, Korea, Vietnam without and be safe at home in Brussels or in Paris or in London or wherever. No North Korean ever came and blew up the London Underground because the British were fighting in Korea. No Viet Cong ever went to Washington and attacked the White House because American troops were in Vietnam. But in the Middle East, we can no longer get away with it. They come to us too. And that we will not understand because we believe we are so inured from war, only the Middle East has wars. We have a million refugees come to Europe without weapons and we say we're being invaded. But when we go to their countries, we always go with horses, swords, tanks, Apache helicopters, armored vehicles. Incredible. We just cannot see the Middle East through the eyes of the people who live there. And nor, I suspect, can most of the people there see the world through our eyes either. If we, we take all that history in, in account uh, and, and we ask ourselves, what is from here the way forward? Uh, there's two questions. First of all, the general question, what is a, a way forward out of the, of the violence and the chaos? And the second question is, does Europe have a role to play and what would that be like? Well, Europe's role in the Middle East since the secret Sykes-Picot agreement 
which effectively divided up the Middle East peoples under our rule without asking them. And then our constant support for Israel, which is, continues to thieve Arab land uh, for Jews and Jews only in occupied territory against international law. Um, I don't see any reason why there is or should be a role for Europe um, or for America for the same reasons. Um, look, I think there are two things which we lack today in trying to not solve, you can't solve crisis. No, no there aren't solutions. In, in the real world of politics and war, there aren't solutions. But there are resolutions. And we need to change our, the way we look at the Middle East. The people there have never asked for democracy. For them, democracy is synonymous with the countries in the West which supported the dictators, which tortured them and imprisoned them and oppressed them. They don't want that, thank you very much. If you actually look what they said, if you look at the placards that I saw in the streets of Cairo, in Tahrir Square, they didn't ask for democracy, nor did they ask for Al-Qaeda or bin Laden. There wasn't a picture of bin Laden. They asked for dignity and they asked for justice. Justice, 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 justice for Palestinians, for Kurds, for Syrians, um, for Israelis, who've also been lied to by us. Remember, we suggested they might have a homeland in all of Palestine, not just that part of Palestine, which was created internationally and legally as Israel. Justice for the Gulf, who have no freedoms at all. And we, don't, we, we need to reassert our values, the word that our politicians like to use, in terms of the Arabs, not in terms of ourselves. These people want dignity and they want justice. They want the end to continuing military injustices and oppression against them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we don't have any institutions. We live in the world of instant communication, of abuse on the internet, six o'clock press conferences, primetime TV. Um, we don't plan anything anymore. I look back, for example, historically, before I was born, not that long before I was born, to the San Francisco Conference of 1945, which set up the United Nations. Now, the politicians or statesmen involved in making that up, they were not doing something for primetime TV because they knew that the fruition of what they struggled for would only come to pass after they were dead of old age. They'd be in their graves. They were locked into something that would have an effect on the generation after next. Now, whether you like the UN or not, it's better than the League of Nations, and the League of Nations is better than the Battle of the Somme or the First World War, pre-League of Nations. And we are not creating these institutions. Look at the refugee crisis. What should we do? We put up borders, we scrap the Schengen plan, we put up more borders, we have states of emergency, we have red level, level four emergency in Belgium. For heaven's sakes, after the First World War, there were millions of Middle East refugees. What happened? The great Norwegian Arctic explorer, Fredhof Nansen, was set up by the League of Nations to be the refugee coordinator in the Middle East for the Great War and in Russia. And he, within a year, he had a system of Nansen passports, they were called, refugee passports which were accepted by 50 countries. So refugee who was fleeing from Aleppo, as many Armenians did, literally from Aleppo, in 1918, 1919, could go to 50 countries and they say, ah, oh, Armenian refugee, there's your passport stamp, sir, thank you issued by the League of Nations, it was the Nansen passport. We have not even thought of doing that. After the greatest bloodbath of the 20th century up to then, the First World War, within one, two years, we had initiatives, forget the Treaty of Versailles for a moment, we had initiatives to help millions of people. Now we have nothing. In the Second World War, in 1941, before the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, in June of 41, when the British still expected Nazi invasion, when you were already occupied, Winston Churchill set up a government committee to organize the occupi occupation of Germany and how civil affairs would be run in occupied German cities. At a time when we expected the Germans to occupy us. The following year, Cambridge University set up degree courses in how to run Germany after its conquest by the Allies. In 1942, that was before El Alamein. Now, here, I'm, I'm, I'm not a great fan of Churchill for various reasons, but here was a man who looked forward, not to the six o'clock news or to the next Blair press conference, but he looked forward years to what we would do when we achieved the impossible and won against Nazism. We don't do that anymore. When the first American tanks crossed the Tigris River, nobody had an idea what to do tomorrow.
But if if you want to look forward uh, and and have a, a more grand plan for and 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 look at the plans from the Middle East, can you plan something with ISIS in place? Is isn't there an an an, an imperative to get rid of, of? There was an imperative to get rid of Saddam. There was an imperative to get rid of the Nusra Front, who are now supposedly our moderates. There is a, an imperative to get rid of ISIS. There was an imperative to get rid of the PLO, to get rid of Arafat, to get rid of Abu Nidal, to get rid of Ayatollah Khomeini. I've reported all these. All these were imperatives. Yes, we'll talk about justice afterwards, but we've got to get rid of this. And after ISIS, there'll be another monster arrive. I suspect, being a cynic. That we're already trying to find the moderates in ISIS. We're going to split it up if we can, pay some. I suspect that's going on now. That's what's actually happening. Not what should be happening. How do we bring justice to the peoples of the Middle East? At which point ISIS is totally irrelevant. It fades into the desert. It's dust. But we won't do that. We want to fight ISIS. We want to meet them on their demands and terms, and we're going to do that. What does ISIS want? The destruction of Europe, the destruction of the Schengen plan, states of emergency, the disappearance of our freedoms. They're succeeding. As we speak, they are succeeding. ISIS got another victory around us. The mere fact that you were consulting about security with the authorities in this city for the talk that I'm giving shows you what ISIS have managed to achieve. Precisely that. And can we wait until they fade? Or what, let me put it in another way, and to wrap up, but what would be an initiative or where we could that we could take or that we could support in terms to get justice to people in Syria where there's hardly a country left at this moment? I suspect Syria is not going to disappear as quickly as you think. I don't mean Syria in these particular borders, but Syria as a historical nation will not cease to exist. It's existed a lot longer than Belgium, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, I think that what you need to do is, I don't know, Angela Merkel, not entirely for the reasons I would have wished, but Angela Merkel got close to it when she said, if we want to maintain our European values, we've got to look after these people. She saw that over and above our institutional protection, there was something more important. And if we abandoned that, our institutions didn't mean anything anymore. I'm going to say this as a slightly humorous reply to your question. Uh, in Iraq, after the invasion, I went down to um, Kufa, uh, near Najaf and Kerber in southern Iraq, Shiite area, actually to see Spanish forces because they were about to pull out after the Madrid bombings, another effective ISIS-type bombing, you see. And that, well, ISIS didn't exist then, of course. Um, and as I was leaving the Spanish base, this huge CIA man came up to me, giant like this. He said, I'm from the agency. I, this high, huge pistol. And he said, what went wrong? <laughs> I said, well, you, you tell me. I mean, you, know, you invaded, I didn't. He said, well, there are gunmen on the streets at night. You know, every time we try to rebuild a school, it's blown up. Every time we put up an electricity pylon, it's stolen. You know, the wires are taken. And I said, well, what if you went back to the Roman times? Go back to the Roman Empire. I wasn't recommending crucifixion, you see. And I said, outside the Roman Empire, everyone was regarded as a barbarian, terrorist, ISIS, you see. But I said, when the Roman Empire absorbed more peoples, they were no longer barbarians. They became citizens of Rome. I said, if your president or my prime minister at the time, my favorite, Mr. Blair, if they had said to the people of Iraq, look, we're not invading you. We're freeing you from Saddam. And if you wish to become citizens of our country, every Iraqi can now become a citizen of the United States or Britain. They wouldn't all have rushed to JFK or London Heathrow. But they would have said, my goodness, these people really do love us. They came for us, not for oil. But we didn't do that. It was not an idea that was going to commend itself to our Western nations, because we did go for oil. I mean, if the gross national product of Iraq had been asparagus, I don't think we would have invaded Iraq, would we? And, um, and so it was clear from the very start we didn't care about the people, you see. And we, don't, we still don't care about the people. I mean, Mr. Corbyn in the parliamentary debate went on and on about the poor people of Raqqa, whom we will kill. And you know, we're already keep killing lots of civilians in Iraq. But it's more than that. 
I don't think we care about the people as a whole, not the individual. That's why we still use this disgusting phrase, collateral damage. I mean, I wouldn't use that about a dog, but we use it primarily about Arabs, of course. You know, if we dropped a bomb on a European nation, well, Yugoslavia was a bit collateral damage, but by and large, we wouldn't use that words about white people with blue eyes who were non-Muslims, you see. Um, but I think it's something bigger than this even, over and above or perhaps below in foundational terms of all our questions about the need for new institutions which can be believed in and justice and dignity is the question that underlies, I think, and this is, you know, 39 years of the Middle East and Mr. Robert, who that's what I'm called, can often get this thing wrong. But um, you see, you have a people, the Muslims, who have not lost their faith. They still believe in God. They believe the Quran is the word of God himself, as passed on to the Prophet Muhammad. They believe it. And it more or less governs the lives of those people. Family, their attitude towards their friends, their attitude towards betrayal, love, honor, whatever. Whereas we in the West have largely lost our faith whether it's because of the Treaty of Vienna, the First World War, you name it. Um, by and large, not many of us go to church anymore. That's why the books we read don't say Muslims and Christians or the Middle East and Christendom. They say Muslims and the West, you see. We're the people of liberal values that like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Human Dignity. They're our gods now. And I think the big question, and it involves things like humiliation, which is asked now in the minds of many people among whom I live, and in my mind too, of course, the same reasons perhaps, is how come a people who have kept their faith have become dominated culturally, socially, economically, militarily by a people who have lost their faith? And this question is never asked directly I'm not sure I know the answer to it, by the way. Um, it is not asked in any direct way in the Arab or Muslim world. I've never heard it put that way in any language. Um, but I think it lies as a foundational question. I use that word foundational too much. But as a very basic question alongside all the other things I mentioned, like major institutions to take account of history dignity, freedom in the most basic sense of the word, freedom to speak, you know. Um, and I don't know how you get to this stage, but I think we've been very much diminished by modernity. The days when our leaders wrote down their ideas on paper with a pen and discussed them for hours and formulated policies that were to bring about the well-being of peoples. And we did do that sometimes cynically and sometimes we did the opposite and the 20th century was not a great century for European civilization but those days seem to have disappeared we are so obsessed and addicted to science the internet blogs websites time twittering twattering you know emails that we have lost our sense that generational problems have to be confronted in a very serious way not with garbage psycho babble language, but seriously in the language of history. And we don't do that. And we have shown no inclination to do it. And the big debate in Britain this week, we should be debating, if we have to debate this rubbish about whether we bomb ISIL in Syria when we're already British bombing it in Iraq, should be about why ISIS exists, how it started. Why did we invade Iraq? Let's dig into this history and find out how we got it wrong and how we can put it right. But no, it's not. In Britain, it's about the future of the Labour Party, which matters more than any Syrian life. And we're pretending it's about the future of Syria. Oh my God, if we're, if we're this far off course, how do you signal the ship to come back to the calmer waters and go in the right direction? I have no idea. But we will be watching out and following you when, as your reporting goes on, next year, 40 years of uh, living in the Middle East. And I'll be 70 years old next year. Well, I was not going to mention your... Uh, I don't mind mentioning it, but the question is, you know, 
as, as, as Arabs are always quick to tell you when you say that this is insoluble, time runs out. Well, not yet for you, no. uh, I trust. Robert Fish, thank you very much for uh, being with us and uh, hope to read a lot from you beyond your 70th anniversary. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes.